I'm very happy to announce now the moderator of our next panel, our fourth panel here at the Munich Cybersecurity Conference, Sandro Geiken. Sandro is director of the Digital Society Institute at ESMT in Berlin. He is also a police, pol policy advisor. He is a director in NATO's SPS program. He authored the first cyber foreign policy strategy for Germany, and he was instrumental in the German-Chinese no spy agreement. You will find Sandra also in business. He just founded the first full spectrum private intelligence agency, Monarch. Sandra, your topic for the fourth panel, more cybersecurity through digital sovereignty. I leave it up to you to introduce your guests. Can you move a little bit to the center yes, of the camera? Um, for the kind introduction. So I'm uh, very honored and uh, pleased, of course, to be here at the Munich Cybersecurity Conference. Uh, despite the digital format, I would love to be with you, Peter, and uh, the gang in Munich now in the hotel, but uh, we hopefully get that, get back there next year. Um, so I just want to briefly uh, set the scene before I introduce my uh, excellent panel uh, we're having here. So the, the topic digital sovereignty is actually something that came up a while ago, and that's uh, keeping us busy, in particular in Germany, uh, from a number of different angles, privacy, security, but also, uh, and more narrowly, uh, in, uh, over the last time, the uh, German industries. And uh, it's beginning to become a topic of greater maturity, uh, of greater interests. So I think it is important to understand the connection that we have between sovereignty and security. So how are the two related? Uh, I was thinking about a, a citation uh, from Winston Churchill. I like to cite Winston Churchill. And uh, he once reportedly said uh, that the only st statistics you can trust are the ones you have falsified yourself, which is a common saying in Germany. And this kind of relates to our topic because IT has a similar problem. Um, there's a lot of state-driven interest to have hidden trapdoors in IT for law enforcement, for espionage, for sabotage in some cases. And the complexity of IT, unfortunately, is so huge and the backdoors kill switches and intentional little errors are so tiny and can look so innocent that it's technically and operationally impossible to validate the system if you have not built it yourself. So maybe a cyber Winston Churchill would have said the only IT you can trust is the one you have falsified yourself. Otherwise, you will never know what's in there. And there's a big difference um, if you are putting something in an IT because you own it in comparison to the uh, certainly still dozens to hundreds of vulnerabilities which are inside these systems anyway. So you could say, um, that any state can hack any machine at any moment and plan something in there, which is certainly true. But having your very own architecture, your own backdoors, kill switches, is, is very different from that. So this access, first of all, is legally required. So even if you discover it and remove it, it will come back in the next iteration of the technology, uh, one way or another. And these kind of accesses are architecturally manufactured and built into these systems. So they enable very high privileges, full access, they're invisible to security mechanisms, they cannot be removed, they can switch off all systems of that brand. And that's a lot of potential power inside these systems of the state who uh, kind of owns the technology um, uh, one way or another. So um, in a way, and this is one concern that we're certainly having in, in many of the German industries, but also in the German government for many technologies that we're looking at, uh, you could become a de facto hostage of the political will of the actor behind it. Be that in China that you're a hostage to a totalitarian dictatorship, or be that that uh, there may be backdoors in there for law enforcement from other entities from more friendly nations. One way or another, uh, there is something in there that you cannot control. And this, of course, is not critical in all cases. I mean, consumer electronics uh, may be the thing that we worry about most, our mobile phones in day-to-day in -day life. Um, but actually, a, a lot of other technologies may be way more critical. So critical national infrastructures, for example, military technology, economically critical communication technologies are very different because there is clearly desirable to not have the possibility of foreign access and to have innovative sovereignty over the baseline technologies as well, because you will be building on top of these technologies entire ecosystems uh, of your own digital uh, making. And then when you're dependent also uh, in terms of innovation on someone else, then you're also not just having so not sovereignty in security, you're also not sovereign in innovation. So at this point, um, sovereignty actually matters. So uh, 
the question is how can I uh, assess that? And manufacturers, of course, will lie to you about the trustworthiness. So the main element by which to assess them is their sovereign affiliation and the nation's interests in backdoors, kill switches, and the like. And at this point, unfortunately, uh, especially the big IT countries have a substantial interest in offensive cyber. So China, we know, uh, is very big on network technology, uh, but still number one internationally in industrial espionage and very big in strategic espionage as well. And on top of that, a totalitarian country. Um, the five eyes, certainly friends and acting in our interest, but uh, they're still having, uh, as one, uh, still being the biggest software producers, and they're still having a strong interest and legal requirements for backdoors in their technologies as well. And we have other actors which are not on the agenda, so, and I frequently like to call on uh, the UAE and the KSA, so Saudi Arabia and, and the, the whole region, because uh, what happens currently in Saudi Arabia with MBS in particular is uh, the, the commercial construction of a major cyber power. So they're getting very, very effective in offensive cyber, may even be uh, among the top three already, very unnoticed because it's a largely industrial effort, not so much uh, in the nation state. And uh, they are already in control of much of the hardware production globally. Uh, so this is something that has not been uh, researched so very well, but they may very soon develop their own offensive interests in backdoors and in weakening technologies in specific cases. And of course, we also have some concrete discussions and cases. The biggest one, of course, is Huawei and 5G. Uh, that's a discussion that is very, very widely going on in Germany with very uh, different opinions and a lot of opinions because 5G, uh, Huawei, of course, is uh, cheap, uh, it's technologically also very advanced, um, and we need a good 5G network, but our economy will depend on the goodwill of China for a long time, uh, and we are supporting a dictatorship in a very critical technology and in a very critical phase of its innovation. Um, but there are also smaller cases on a day-to-day -day uh, basis. So one other example, for example, is the German automotive sector right now who's looking for operating systems and is now eyeing QNX as an operating system for German cars, which is a Canadian operating system, uh, part of the five eyes may have a hidden access somewhere. And uh, while we will not expect that the five eyes will abuse that in our disadvantage, it may be uh, that uh, this secret is kind of leaked somewhere. This has happened in the past repeatedly, and then uh, criminals may have this kind of access. Uh, we may have lost it, and it will be, it could be a critical problem uh, for the German cars. So it would be nice to have trusted, trustworthy European sovereign technologies for these cases, uh, and not just technologies, also a more open and active culture for innovation, also better capabilities in critical security functions. And we would certainly have the outset for that as well. We know that we have great engineers, we have big tech companies, uh, many of which are now building IT systems. Ironically, uh, a lot of these very innovative uh, entities in the United States are trying to, of the big software companies, are very much trying to uh, hire Europeans into their services because we have uh, very good engineers, very good education. So we could do all these things ourselves, um, but we're just not really doing them. So the question is, do we really want that? Where, would, where do we want that? And how do we get there? Um, so this is a bit the background, uh, back, background of what we will discuss today. Uh, we will ask ourselves why and where do we need digital sovereignty? Which technologies do we actually require? Uh, who could be a trusted European supplier of those technologies? How can we build them? Uh, who needs to create which kinds of incentives? And I'm now very much looking forward to my fabulous panel to discuss this with. Uh, I will not introduce them uh, because I always prefer if panelists introduce themselves uh, quickly. And uh, I will start the round of introductions by asking, uh, first of all, for your introduction uh, of your, yourself, and then by asking also for a little definition of digital sovereignty. And we will start with Robert, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and um, a very good introduction uh, by you, Sandro. My name is Robert Kosla. I'm, I'm Director of Department of Cybersecurity in the Chancellery of the Prime Minister in Poland. Of course, our responsibility is to take care about, about our investment in a modern digital economy. So, of course, uh, not to not forget about, uh, about uh, cybersecurity aspects. Uh, so, the topic today topic uh, about digital sovereignty we have a lot of discussions uh, 
starting with uh, where we participate actively as a member state, um, starting with uh, federated cloud environment, the new uh, new secure and um, digital digitally sovereign uh, federated European uh, cloud, supporting uh, development of modern uh, modern economy. Of course, uh, take into consideration different scenarios so representing different industries. They, the, the, this is the area where we are going uh, also to invest from IPSA mechanism. Um, uh, what's more, of course, this is a question of um, uh, development, the level of development uh, from European perspective. Uh, uh, I'm responsible and my department is responsible for uh, recovery and resiliency plan in Poland in the, for the cybersecurity component, of course, our focus is on uh, development of uh, trusted uh, cloud services based on the recent investment of the Polish government to have uh, more resilient uh, cloud services available for citizens and also uh, companies. Uh, you ask about um, about definition of, um, of uh, sovereignty. And I think uh, we can look at this definition, and uh, at least from my perspective, I'm looking at this as a, uh, something like um, a controlling influence. So uh, sovereign digital um, uh, sovereignty, from my perspective, it's a question of governance. It's a question of impact. It's um, and the way how we can we can um, influence uh, the digital market, especially in Europe, digital single market, through facilitation directions and of course financing uh, the major activities uh, to develop uh, this market so i think that's that would be the first uh, introduction uh, statement from my side thank you yes thank you excellent definition and we'll come back to you because you're the only politician on this panel so you will have to take care of the politics part um i will now hand over to verna who i know is a fanatic in digital sovereignty verna uh, please introduce yourself and give us your definition of digital sovereignty Thanks a lot, Sandro. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Werner Strasser. I'm the founder and CEO of Fragmentic Storage Solutions here in Austria. Uh, actually, as Sandro already mentioned, I'm, I'm a kind of fanatic about digital sovereignty, which uh, has been uh, made me have these, these kind of caps from my marketing department. Uh, no, uh, actually, of course, it is a question of, uh, yeah, let's say paradigms. We, we somehow have to uh, synchronize our semantic understanding of, of the term of digital sovereignty. Uh, of course, I agree with, with just about everything that Robert uh, mentioned before. And our focus, of course, is not only to stay in, let's say, the political sphere of a definition. Uh, actually, our goal, our approach is uh, way stronger to make it possible for the individual, for the small, medium enterprise, for the larger enterprise, and even, of course, also for, for governments, uh, to have a chance, a technology-driven chance to achieve digital sovereignty by themselves and to retain it. So in my understanding, and that's maybe the reason why I'm not a politician, uh, I prefer to trust uh, on mass and on science and not so much on rules. And so for us, uh, digital sovereignty is actually something that is, uh, of course, not only by technology, but uh, in our point of view, mainly achievable by having technology solutions to enable the individual and the SME, actually the citizen uh, and all the larger constructs of human people uh, to achieve this kind of sovereignty. Thank you, Vanna. And I will now hand it over to Cyril, who is uh, a representative of a large European company. Hello, Cyril Dujardin. I'm in charge of uh, digital security in Atos. Digital security covers uh, the uh, cyber security part of it and the uh, the uh, national security, as we see a lot of convergence and uh, the convergence of cyber and national security is, uh, is valid not only for, for sovereign topic. Uh, I will not uh, challenge the definition of sovereign. What I would say is for a, a large uh, IT company like Atos, sovereignty, digital sovereignty is kind of schizophrenic because uh, in one way, uh, our customers uh, are asking for, uh, for the control of what they are of their data, of their information, of their uh, processes, of everything. So they're asking for sovereignty. But on the other end, they want to get uh, the service, uh, the optimal service. They want to get something that is useful for them, being in, uh, in digital overall or in cybersecurity. Uh, and of course, 
the first uh, role of cybersecurity is to is to protect. Uh, so they would like both to be protected, but to be protected at a level that allow them to be in control and not to be dependent on other third party. So sometimes, as a as a supplier, we have to manage this schizophrenic uh, view on uh, is it is the is the is the medicine worse than the the, uh, the 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 that the, the disease and we have to really deal with that to uh, in our handling with our customers thank you sir um so now finally i'd like to hand it over to uh sergey who is joining us from palo alto networks Thanks, Sandro, and thanks for having me back at this conference. So my name is Sergey Epp. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Central Europe at Palo Alto Networks uh, for the last two years. Um, and previously, I used to uh, to run cyber defense in one large DAX security company. Um, and I guess, you know, if you ask me on the definition on, uh, on digital sovereignty, I would say most people agree that, um, you know, in any global economy and hyper-connected world, um, free and secure flow of data is very important in order to stay competitive, right? So the answer it cannot be that we build everything uh, ourselves. I mean, I'm not aware of any big product in any country where uh, everything is done just by by this specific uh, nation. And I think, looking also, um, you know, at the most promising digital natives uh, here in Germany, um, like Zalando's delivery heroes, um, volocopters of this world, I think they are all as well interconnected uh, with the digital system, right? So I guess every every organization has to understand what is the, the true value add in the system and how to um, you know how to create this value add and not to reinvent the entire wheel. Um, and I would say um, Mr. Shinga he put the right challenge um, in his keynote on the table, um, really to you know asking us how we create trust in the system and, and what is really trusted and what not. And um, also, I like the definition of influence, trustfulness, where certainly um, a lot of perspectives can be given, like reliability, security, privacy, self-determination. Um, but I guess in the end, um, you know, this this cloud tech. Um, where the data is not necessary anymore bound to location is something where we all have to learn how to protect this data, the consumers and as well the, uh, the vendors. So let me try to reflect uh, what we hear from our customers, um, you know, who are in particular very sensitive about digital sovereignty. And um, those customers are seeking, first of all, for more transparency, right? So we've tried to respond to that, um, for example, and provide really um, insight on how we are um, how we're driving our supply chain how we're manufacturing chips where they're manufactured uh, how they're sealed how they are really delivered uh, to the customers how we check the integrity afterwards uh, insights on our internal security um, um, insights and the the right really to handle the data uh, whether data is stored in europe or in the us um, so i think these are the first aspects which are being um, being asked and my definition of digital sovereignty would be in context of cyber security specifically that um, you have to have the capabilities to validate the trustfulness um, and uh, trustfulness of the organization but also of the technology right and all these transparency initiatives i've just mentioned but also others like technical validations um, or even certifications there are a lot of great initiatives like c5 ANSI, or soc 2.0 where you can ask um, large vendors to provide insights over hundreds of reports, uh, of, of pages actually in reports, to describe how security is being uh, you know, managed um, uh, across those companies. Um, another example from, uh, from the automotive sector is, for instance, that um, you know, they, they've created or come up with a, with a separate certification as well, uh, which is called TSAX, um, which they're uh, trying now to adopt or force as large manufacturers across the entire supply chain. So I think from their point of view, it's also part um, of the digital sovereignty to ensure that all the suppliers are being properly secured. So that's one view. And I think a second view is uh, what we hear very often is that um, digital Sovereignty is also something about uh, trust into the technology. I think we had a really discussion last year on the panel here. Uh, while we can trust an organization, I think technology remains far too complex to be trusted, uh, simply because we are all interconnected and there could be a lot of systematic risks which we don't understand. Um, SolarWind supply chain um, attacks we've seen in the past are just one small you know, uh, aspect of this, uh, of this iceberg. 
Um, so I guess it shows us that even the most advanced companies out there can be compromised. And therefore, um, we in cybersecurity are always you know, referring back to the uh, to a strategy of zero trust architecture. So really trying to reduce the trust as much as possible and always verify uh, this technology. And specifically our customers, um, you know, who are using insecure technology, having a lot of technical debt, which they cannot change. They're seeking for compensating measures to, you know, have a permanent layer of verification of such technologies, or even understanding how they can decouple that uh, from the system by, you know, controls like segmentation and so on. So in, in simple words, if you, if you can't trust the technology, um, and you, you don't really want to change it, or you can't change it, I think you can create always successful compensating measure for that, uh, for that part. Thank you, Sergey. And uh, I think you very nicely uh, turned back to the uh, overall topic of the conference, which Wolfgang Ischinger already mentioned yesterday, namely trust. So trust, uh, as he said, is the most important ingredient in diplomacy. Uh, also because you cannot really verify what's in the mind of your uh, uh, other nation's counterpart. Um, but I think in IT, as you already mentioned, we also have this concept of zero trust or trustworthy. So trustworthy, uh, that's also an interesting philosophical distinction, by the way. Trust is something that I deliver in advance as a belief in something. Trustworthy, on the other hand, is something that I can actually verify and validate. So if somebody or a system is trustworthy, I can actually verify uh, it's uh, particular characteristics which are relevant for that. So I think the question for us is, since our trust has been uh, shaken every now and then in Europe in, in some of these systems and in their reliability, functionality, and uh, some of the security aspects, um, are there any areas where we actually need trustworthy technologies rather than trust into a vendor? And uh, is that something that we can generate by rules, uh, by setting up a law, or is a law not sufficient? And do we have to actually gain control of the architecture of the technological development process itself? So this is something uh, I would like to discuss with you now. And I think I would first like to ask uh, Ciro uh, to ask uh, what a large company like Artos would, where, where would you consider parts uh, where rules are sufficient, where trust is sufficient, which level of trust, where is trustworthy required? Uh, was the artist position. Yeah, I think uh, from what Sergei told us, it's uh, quite clear we have to differentiate uh, some technology and some level of, uh, let's say, of technology that uh, needs to be sovereign, that needs to be trusted. Uh, but you can't rely uh, on the sum of product to be, uh, to be uh, fully, uh, let's say, uh, secure, trusted. So you need to uh, to really look at the overall uh, environment, uh, not coming from the uh, let's say the hardware software system to uh, to have the full view. So what we believe is that you need to um, to 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 secure or to uh, highlight a certain number of technology around uh, cryptography around. Uh, digital identity, uh, let's say uh, artificial intelligence, which is a big word, but uh, uh, we need also to have uh, to have some uh, trust on it. Uh, I'm talking also about quantum, where uh, the, the future proof technology that will be at the base of, uh, let's say, quantum proof technology, let's say, uh, uh, deciphering of, uh, of uh, non-quantum proof technology and the use for, for advanced cryptography. Uh, so we need to have these bases uh, capacity uh, to be able to be offered to uh, to our uh, let's say not only our, our government because government is only uh, one one layer uh, of course the, the fundamental and the most uh, let's say trustful uh, layer in our in our uh, in our world uh, in our, at least in our in our western world uh, still uh, but uh, also for any company I think we are we are sometimes let's say uh, mix but sometimes separating the need for for uh, uh, let's say government and critical site uh, from the need of uh, corporate but more and more these two worlds are, uh, are are merging are converging and we really need to because uh, when you are uh, you were talking about a car manufacturer, Okay, uh, cars can can become weapons, uh, so it's not anymore. Uh, you know, you can use them, you can uh, you can take control of them, and 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 have them become weapon. If you are, uh, let's say, uh, in uh, agriculture and uh, and uh, using uh, a phosphate nit nitrate, uh, you can you, you can use it as a bomb, and you can let's say uh, put it in the middle of a, have it in the middle of a, of a city and make it as a bomb. So, no more uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, no more separation between these two universes. So meaning we need this basic technology. Then we need trusted, not trusted technology, we need trusted uh, companies, trusted layers, uh, or, or, or customers are asking us to have, uh, let's say, trustees, people that are uh, able to to build interface between this, uh, let's say, this first layer of technology, which is, which are the, the key one that we can rely, rely on, that can be uh, audited by uh, the various, uh, let's say, uh, security bodies of, of our of, of, of our uh, of our countries. Then this trusted uh, capacity to interface this technology with the, uh, let's say, the open world. When I say open world. Why uh, wouldn't we use the best of breed of the security of uh, of uh, some uh, uh, some uh, let's say uh, friends some uh, friends in uh, in the U.S. some friends in uh, in other country? Why wouldn't we use this technology? Why wouldn't use the capacity of the hyperscaler to uh, to to deliver uh, fantastic uh, let's say uh, cloud capacity and, uh, and and transform the the world we are living in in digital we should use this technology but still we need to control this basic layer and we need to have trusted provider uh, in all the in all uh, european providers as well in europe but german german in germany that are french in france that are uh, uh, let's say dutch in uh, in netherlands we need to have this uh, capacity to have these uh, trusted parties that can make the, the, the gateway between these uh, key technologies that we need to control and develop and uh, and finance and uh, and uh, and get the, the hand, our hands on and the uh, let's say more uh, global players of this uh, security world. Thank you. Um, so, Robert, from your perspective as uh, a, a government uh, regulator, what's where would you like to have uh, your own technology? So more more control over what you're actually doing and where do you think rules are sufficient and how do you validate, intend to validate the rules? Yes, of course, we definitely we need, a, we need laws, we need rules and we need standards because we need to set the stage for our collaboration uh, with academia and industry. Of course, in this triangle, this is the only way how we can uh, develop the trust already mentioned by by my uh, our colleagues from the, from this panel uh, trust uh, can be declared but of course need to be uh, can, can be declared but uh, declaration is not valid as soon as it's not proven by the by the real steps by the real activities so that's why of course from one side we have uh, laws re regarding of course um, uh, respect to uh, to investment uh, respect to the rights uh, uh, legal rights and also privacy and of course uh, and uh, the country country rights to to be sovereign uh, the european union to 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 take a role of, as well uh, on the other side, we have a rules where we set the stage for uh, for industry, how to operate, how to um, um, develop products, how to deliver them, how to implement them securely. At the end of the day, of course, we have we have best practices that need to be followed, with, that need to be developed, and usually best practices are uh, should be developed together with industry. Uh, governments are not uh, uh, devices and services developers, so that's why, of course, we need this partnership. On the other side. The way how we can check this trust and how we can improve this trust and really prove the trust and trustworthiness, it's uh, starting from the softest uh, ways. It's uh, testing, 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 testing. Of course, uh, we need to check whether the product services uh, complies with uh, technical specifications and st standards. The second is a more formal evaluation. And finally, of course, certification. Uh, but this is this is ideal world, and then we know that uh, we are not living in the ideal world. That's why, of course, uh, uh, in the European uh, European Union, we we set the stage for um, a Cyber Security Act that define requirements for uh, evaluation and uh, certification of uh, cyber uh, of the product itself. On the other side, when we look at the market um, um, from the perspective of how many products are already certified, which are the eligible criteria actually for evaluation certification, and we, we found a lot of gaps, um, just as, as you referred to 5G. 
as you refer to um, the next generation of technologies and also serial touch them, uh, some, some emerging technologies that will be implemented. The basic question is how to prove that those technologies are resilient, that those technologies can be trusted, that those technologies cannot be misused. Because on one side, we are talking about rules, but the bad guys do not respect the rules. So, of course, the rules are for governments, the rules are for industry, the rules are for academia, the rules are for citizens, but not, uh, not for the bad guys and politically or uh, economically motivated uh, gangsters. Uh, so that's why, of course, um, we should, and what, what was already also touched by Sergei about uh, zero trust, and uh, it's, 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 uh, zero trust is more about philosophy, that uh, we should assume not, not to trust in any, in, uh, in 100 percent of um, security solutions. That's why, of course, we need to talk about multi-level uh, security. And when I, when I refer to uh, the definition of uh, sover sovereignty, I talked about impact. I talked about uh, controlling influence. So that's why this type of con controlling influence can be set only in the direct partnership between, between uh, government and, and not declarative partnership. Because we heard for la at least last 10 years, we heard, we heard a, lot, a lot about um, public-private partnership. But uh, the um, examples of the, uh, this um, uh, successful public-private partnership where government, of course, respect um, the, the rights and interests of companies to, to develop and to, to, to gain profits from their uh, activities. And the, um, the industry respect the government's, uh, the, the right of the government to regulate, to control because of the responsibility of governments in front of their citizens. So the way uh, how I would address the topic of trust and building the trust uh, I, I can provide you example from Poland, because uh, in 2019, uh, when we uh, started to implement the NIST directive in our law, national law called um, Law on National Cybersecurity System, system we, we consider system as an ecosystem of um, uh, government, industry, organizations and citizens' involvement as well. So we, we, we found that the, the need to develop this type of partnership with industry and we set the stage for this type of uh, effective partnership with um, cybersecurity cooperation program. This program was announced in October 2019. Until now, we have we have almost 20, 20 companies um, uh, enrolled into this program, pro, uh, companies and organizations, also NGOs. And we collaboratively work, first of all, to introduce uh, the most um, uh, recent and uh, the most um, um, the most resilient uh, uh, solutions, the most resilient services. We also incorporate education for users and uh, security baselines provided by 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 uh, companies. So I think this is we cannot, as I said, we cannot declare the trust without the the real steps. And real steps require some at least the minimum level of of, of the rules, and then goodwill. And uh, facilitation for the for the uh, for, for for the effects. So that's what I wanted actually to to address this in, in this part. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, real steps is a good uh, a good uh, step forward, I believe. And I I can uh, shift this over to Vanna because I know for him, uh, real steps would be uh, mainly technology. So, and I think an interesting question is. Uh, why haven't we built more baseline technologies in Europe, in Germany? Why are we not stronger on some of the technological parts when we have such a great base of engineers, a great base of industrial tech companies? And what would so what's wrong in the market, so to speak? And which incentives do we need, or how do we have to reshape the market to create incentives for more sovereignty on the technical level? Yeah, thanks for, for this question, uh, Sandra. Actually, I think uh, the the perspectives uh, of an of a European uh, high tech company, or in, in in our case, a, a rather young startup company. Even though I'm in this industry since uh, nearly thirty years now, uh, of course, it is not easy always to uh, find out who has a real interest in this game. Uh, when we talk about cybersecurity, it's it's actually uh, also, of course, a, a, a way or a, a one of the aspects of asymmetric hybrid warfare. Uh, and it's maybe not in the consciousness of the broader public, but actually we are all affected by that. Uh, and of course, uh, there are several levels uh, to this problem. And so uh, maybe to start with the most obvious uh, one, uh, these, these 
friend-foe uh, recognition to find out who is your real partner. Uh, does it change over time? And especially when we talk about uh, political changes in, in all the countries uh, and all the blocks we, we've mentioned today, uh, it, it's getting somehow tricky. And uh, maybe maybe one way to, to better understand this is, is somehow the, uh, let's say, historical view. Uh, and when we go back some 20 years, uh, I just remember the former CIA director, James Woolsey, uh, very bluntly and directly uh, told to, uh, I think it was the uh, Wall Street Journal, and, and then later on it, it was uh, reprinted here at Spiegel and some other newspapers that said, uh, why we are spying on you, because you are actually, uh, yeah, you, you are bribing, and, and so actually European technology is not really worth uh, spying on it, because you don't, you are not advanced enough. So somehow, uh, at that point, this was very blunt, some 20 years ago. Uh, but of course, I think we still have to uh, be very clear here that uh, being uh, the newest kid in town, the, the new block, the EU, actually, uh, we need to have some more, maybe a little bit more solid spine on that. And so uh, I also am I'm, I'm fully aware that uh, it makes a big difference if you are living and, and working in a small neutral country like, like here in Austria, or if you live in a larger, maybe more uh, fully integrated NATO member country and so on. And so I'm, I'm pretty convinced that it's not only the set of skills uh, that makes a difference in who can uh, really produce, develop and produce baseline technology. Uh, it's also, of course, a question of the, uh, let's say, economic and political will to do it. And uh, one aspect of, of this game, which is uh, actually uh, very frustrating, uh, not so much uh, for, for, for us here at the moment, but, but to, to see this in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, a lot of very interesting uh, technologies were developed. A lot of very interesting organizations actually have been founded. Uh, and when it came to market readiness, when it came to the situation where other countries, other blocks, uh, would definitely uh, do public procurement of these technology and, and support these baseline uh, sovereignty uh, technologies. Uh, actually, the Europeans used to uh, step on their own toes, uh, have a lot of regulations. Uh, of course, it's taxpayer money. Of course, there needs to be a, a whole set of rules to, to avoid corruption. But nevertheless, uh, if you uh, have too many rules uh, or rules that actually stop you by developing or to develop things like that, uh, it's getting actually very tricky. And uh, just let me uh, answer to, to the, the former question also, uh, when it comes to the comparison between trusting in rules and regulations and laws, uh, I fully agree with Robert uh, that, of course, these regulations are necessary. Uh, I just want to stress the point that uh, it is not enough. It definitely is not enough. You have to uh, mitigate these challenges by adopting technology, adopting science, physics, math, uh, in a way that enables you to have all the layers of, of protection to, to have a chance to achieve sovereignty. And so, for instance, uh, just, just the uh, historic example, uh, Adi Shamir, uh, 42 years ago at MIT, uh, published his first paper on, on secret sharing, which is actually an old mathematical uh, algorithm in the meantime, uh, but nevertheless, it, it, uh, it helps us protect against uh, future quantum uh, computers. And so actually, uh, I think it's not so much only a question of uh, economic situation or political situation. It's also a question of, are we really interested as a society to achieve digital sovereignty? And who probably uh, wants to have it, who is responsible to have it, and who maybe pretends but isn't really interested in it. And so I think this is a very tricky situation. Uh, and of course, yeah, when we just uh, think about things like the US Cloud Act of, of 2018, uh, there is a lot of, um, yeah, uh, I don't want to say this bad word, but there's a lot of strange arguments out there. Uh, and, and if you really read the text and understand the meaning, uh, you should think about, or we have to think about uh, if we really want to achieve digital sovereignty or we, if we should stop pretending it. Yeah, thanks, Werner. Um, okay, so I have a question from the uh, from the audience which relates to uh, what you said, Werner, because of course we know that, that especially in Europe, one, one larger problem is governments and regulations. So it's, uh, it's frequently seen to be a roadblock 
uh, and uh, for innovation and something that rather complicates things than enabling them. And uh, this fits nicely to the question that we're having from the audience, namely how can governments and companies work together to secure stability and reliability, even to fight those gangsters, as Robert just said. And I'd like to ask that question to Sergey, especially uh, with a look to the United States. Are there maybe lessons that we can learn from the United States over here in Europe regarding the cooperation of private and public? Uh, or are you guys just as bad as we are? Yeah, I think, you know, there's definitely lessons to learn everywhere. Um, and specifically, um, you know, in, in the in the sector of uh, PPPs, public-private partnerships, I think the, the U.S., um, as you've asked a specific example, invested very early on um, by creating certain sharing alliances, uh, right? All the all the different ISECs, uh, so information sharing alliances, uh, for instance, the FSISEC in the financial space, uh, the energy, there's an energy side, um, ISEC and so on. Uh, they've been created and made um, uh, with, with a structure that both the private and public sector cooperate um, and also uh, exchange um, not just uh, you know operative threat intelligence, but also a lot of insights on tactics, um, on um, you know best practices, on countermeasures, uh, and so on. I think we do have very very solid first steps. Uh, we went you know pushing as well our um, our countries in this direction. There are great examples um, again here in Germany with uh, you know CSSA or um, DCSO in the UK with Cyber Defense Alliance, for instance, in the financial sector space. But I guess the the, the partnership between the public and the private sector is still very very weak compared to the US, and this has as well some other aspects. Um, simply because in the US it's very common that. Um, you would swap um, as an individual during your career between the private and public sector and by that already um, get a much more better understanding for the other world, right? In the, in the public sector, um, things are working completely different than the private sector. Uh, I do not see this too often in Europe, uh, unfortunately. I think therefore these two sectors remain um, very often yeah, isolated or not, not well understood. Uh, well, I guess the problems, um, the set of problems in both sectors is the same, and, 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 a, and a partnership would definitely create much more better, um, yeah, results in that aspect. And perhaps um, one quick comment as well to uh, to, the, to the previous question on, you know, how to build specifically. Um, or try to, uh, you know, to, to support and subsidize basically um, this digital sovereignty in Europe as well. A couple of um, days ago, I've looked up for the for the venture funding um, which went into the cybersecurity space uh, during the last year, and uh, this is pretty re pretty much related because I think a lot of this innovation is not happening just top down from the government uh, to the industry, but also from the industry to the government, right? Being presented as an idea, and last year there were more than seven or eight billion invested. Um, into cybersecurity, and 76% of the spending went to the U.S. companies, 20% to Israel. So 96% of funding, um, and out of this 96% of funding, 85% of funding was seed funding, so new companies being created. They went to do to these countries, right? Um, and what does it mean for us, right, having such a scenario? It means that um, there's definitely a lot of money. Uh, having worked in the financial industry, I can say um, money finds always you know the right company if you present the right problem and if you start to work on this problem uh, very early on so i guess the, the challenge here is not really um not throwing money um on, on the sector i think we need really to try to focus on the problem and not the symptoms so having first of all um, um a proper plan how we uh, how we grow the the cyber skills, right? I think there's a clear misalignment between um, the you know the formal education and and the private sector demands um, in that space. So creating more professorships position, um, you know, investing more in research. Uh, on the other hand, trying to um, to create the demand as well in cyber for cybersecurity in Europe, uh, simply because um, you know we are we are lacking very often the the awareness um, and have to learn the hard way before the hacks is happening, and I think that's something where we can also uh, be a bit creative. Um, uh, Bettina Dice yesterday from Allianz, she was presenting as well the concept of cyber insurances. Um, and I think that could be, for instance, such a tool or instrument to say, hey, let's make cyber insurances mandatory for every company. And by that, guarantee a free assessment for the companies who do not have this risk understanding, right? And who understand then that they have to pay more. 
So creating this demand, creating this market will also help to mature, um, uh, you know, mature the cybersecurity um, uh, community. And then in the end, you have as a final step just to create the right environment for founders. Um, I think it's still challenging in some of the European countries uh, in terms of uh, taxation and so on for founders who are taking more risk really to get these benefits from, from more risks, right? Um, so that's also a problem which remains um, not just in cyber world, but of course for all the startups and founders in the space. So I think the good news is the money is there and always finds its, its way. So we have just to focus really on the foundation. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Unfortunately, uh, there would be a lot to discuss, uh, but we're at the end of our time and uh, we're now entering into the coffee break. I'm surprised, though, and uh, excited to see that that uh, we're actually having a lot more alignment on those topics of digital sovereignty these days than just a few years ago. Um, we can really see that the discussion has matured quite a lot, that several of the ideas are getting much more concrete, and uh, that we're also getting support uh, from uh, the United States and other countries to uh, develop more sovereignty in Europe. Um, so this, I believe, is also in the spirit of what Wolfgang Ischinger said at the beginning, that uh, more digital sovereignty in Europe is not something, not a situation that creates competition, uh, but rather something that enhances opportunities for cooperation. So in that spirit, I'd also like to thank you, uh, dear panel members, for joining. Uh, it was a privilege to have you. Thank you very much. And now everybody enjoy the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this panel on digital sovereignty. Thank you, Sandro Geiken. Thank you, Robert Kostler, Werner Strasser, Cyril Dujardin, and Sergey Epp. After our short coffee break, I will introduce and uh, hand over to Oliver Rolofs, the co-founder of the Munich Cybersecurity Conference. Hi, hello, and Hi, good to you, have Sabina. you here finally. <laughs> yeah. So the stage is yours. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you so much for this kind handover, Sabina. And before we enter the coffee break, I just wanted to highlight again uh, a very, really thrilling initiative um, which uh, sounds really very promising and I think also brings uh, more power into the question of digital sovereignty. It's um, a new network, Ensure Collaborative, uh, which you can see now in the display, uh, a new great network of Europeans or Europe's security makers and safety clusters. Uh, here we see them again and now let's listen to the great music before we come back after the coffee break.